Hello, and welcome to episode 330 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast. My name is Seth Parrott, and historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this fine March 19th, Bill? I'm doing great, Seth, and we don't have sponsors, but I do want to give a shout out to Old Salt Coffee. I sent a sample of the uh, silent service blend of old salt coffee, and boy, was it good. That is some good stuff. I'm not going to lie. He, he, uh, this mm -hmm. gentleman sent me the same stuff, and I got another one, too. It was uh, Haze Gray. There's a brown I, I chew. Yeah, that was it. Brown chew blend, and then there's the uh, there's a battleship, a oh, battleship blend, blend of black too. Yeah. Battleship Gray. That's right. Yeah, I've right. had the Battleship Gray. My wife really likes it. So I've only mm -hmm. I've only tried the the silent service. Uh, so far, and it was, I killed that bag inside of like four days. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it was good. Because <laughs> I make I make my coffee like use motor oil. I mean, it's black as uh, night, man. <laughs> so thank so, you to all Old Salt Coffee. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Obviously, our third member of our crew is here, the fantastic historian, the lovely John Parshall. How are you today, John? How are you doing? I'm doing doing good. I am uh, just about to get ready to start packing. I'll be yeah. leading a leading a tour for the World War II Museum across the Pacific here, uh, leaving on Thursday. So, yeah, I'll actually I'll be out in Hawaii. I'll be on the Missouri here in another three days. So, yeah. when, uh, where where all are you uh, leading this bad boy? We we start in Pearl Harbor and mm -hmm. then uh, go to the Marianas. So mm -hmm. we'll tour Saipan, Tinian, and then Guam. Uh, this year, we are not making it up to Iwo Jima because there's an active volcano erupting off of the, the invasion beaches, literally just a couple hundred yards off the shore. So that got scrubbed. Uh, that gives us an extra day in Saipan. Uh, Which is not a bad thing either. Not a bad thing. You know, we're going to get going to get to do the tank swim this year and going to swim out to the tanks that got knocked out in the lagoon. Um, but then the after tour, which I'll be dealing with, uh, we're going to go down to Peleliu. And I'm looking forward to seeing that again. Oh, boy. Super cool. What a tour. Yeah, really great tour. And James Scott will be my co-historian. He's actually bringing in a crew. They're doing the, the Philippines tour even as we speak. And some of those Philippines tour people are going to meet us in Saipan and do the main tour in the Marianas. So, yeah, it should be cool. John, that, that is arranged through the World War II Museum. So if any of you are interested in doing one of those tours next year, just go to the World War II New Orleans. It's the National World War II Museum website. And yep. there's a place they can could, they could register, right? That is absolutely correct, yeah. I'll be doing Great. this tour in March. I'll be doing uh, another one to Guadalcanal in August. And uh, yeah, that should, that should wrap up my tours uh, for this year. Fantastic. Yeah. All good stuff. All yeah. good stuff. So, gentlemen, we need to wrap up this massive, tremendously enormous, huge, whatever other adjective I can use, battle of late a golf. Powerful. Powerful. Powerfully, powerfully, powerfully massively, massively huge. huge, enormous, yes. That was <laughs> odd. We actually just said the exact same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. well, well, anyway, on with the show. Uh, the battle of late a golf was, as we did say, massive indeed, simply put. Uh, it was the largest naval battle in modern history, encompassing four separate engagements, as we have talked about through these last several episodes, and involving two different American fleets, that being the 3rd and 7th Fleet, as well as four different Japanese task forces. The battle was truly tremendous. Of the four engagements encompassing Lady Gulf, the battle off Cape Engano, and it's not Cape Engano, it's Cape Engano, is both the last major fight of the battle and quite possibly the most consequential. And we'll get to that why here in just a few minutes. After receiving word from scouts hailing from Ted Sherman's group, Task Group 38.3, that a Japanese carrier task force had been spotted to his north, Admiral William F. Halsey dropped everything else he had and turned Task Force 38 north in an effort to chase down and destroy the enemy carriers. The problem was, of course, that the enemy carriers under the command of Admiral Ozawa Jizaburo were in fact a decoy force meant to lure Halsey away from the main action soon to occur in San Bernardino Strait with Kurita's center force, which you heard all about that last week. As we know, Halsey did not realize this was a ruse, or at least we'd like to think, and felt that the carrier force was indeed the main Japanese threat. Regardless of what we know now, Cape Engano was a carrier battle 
the last carrier battle, albeit one-sided, of the war. And one-sided or not, was an, it was an important aspect in the lives of those who were witness to it. And as the final engagement in the overall Battle of Lady Gulf, it's what we're going to talk about today. So this is this is a very um, one-sided carrier battle. And, you know, you almost hesitate to call it a carrier battle, but, I mean, there are aircraft carriers involved in both sides. And we've seen carrier battle shift from Coral Sea to Midway, so Eastern Solomon, Santa Cruz, Phil Sea, all these titanic struggles. Mm -hmm. And this one just kind of goes out with a whimper. Yeah. But it's important yeah. to the same. It's a yeah. battle the same way a deer hunter versus deer is a battle. Yeah. 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 This really is sort of a, a poignant and pathetic note to sort of end the carrier warfare in this in this particular war on. But that, you know, this is the, the status of the, of the Japanese Navy at this point. So. But to be clear, John, this isn't the last we're going to see of aircraft carriers. It's just the last aircraft carrier versus aircraft carrier battle. Correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So speaking of the Japanese aircraft carriers, Ozawa's force had always been the sacrificial lamb of Shogo, of the entire show plan for Lady Gulf. <clears throat> and Ozawa was none too happy about this assignment at all. He he knew from the get-go that his people were kind of, you know, being hung out to dry, so to speak. Yeah. But he didn't really have too much of a choice in the matter at all. Um, you'll recall that Ozawa's carriers were essentially stripped of their best aircraft and pilots by Toyota Suemu, by Admiral Toyota Suemu, uh, during the catastrophe off Formosa. And if you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to that episode because we talk about that very thing. So, John, initially, and Bill, initially all eight of Japan's aircraft carriers were slated for this event. But as we know now, only four came to the party. Bill, what... Talk about a little bit about this force, and then John, I'd like you to pile on to to, to some of these carriers here. T tell us what's going on here, guys. Yeah, yeah. So Oz Ozawa insisted, and obviously won the argument that only four of his carriers should be oh, four of Japan's carriers should be sacrificed on the altar uh, during this upcoming battle. The force that Ozawa was bringing to the party was paltry, and a pathetic example of a once proud fleet consisting of four carriers, three of which were light carriers. Zuiho, Chitose, and Chuoda, the, the two battleships con converted to hybrid carries, Ise and Huga, and three light cruisers. John, you know a lot more about this than I do. <laughs> yeah, so um, for those of you who are surprised that the Japanese even had eight aircraft carriers left to their name after the Battle of Phil Sea, it's, it's true. They've actually got closer to 10, but not all of them are commissioned yet. Uh, Shinano is still... Um, a building, even as we speak, she's the, the converted Yamato class hull that's going to be turned into a carrier and sunk ignominiously in early 1945. Um, so there are at this point three new fleet carriers, uh, Unryu, which is the lead ship of that class, and her sisters Amagi and Katsuragi. Um, but they have only just been put into service. In fact, uh, I believe it's Katsuragi uh literally just gets commissioned on october 15th and so she doesn't have an air group none of these carriers have got an air group and then there's some old uh slower light carriers like ryuho and hosho uh hosho being arguably the oldest purpose-built aircraft carrier in the world i think she was commissioned in like 22 or 24 None of these are, you know, fit to stand up in a carrier battle. They're too slow or they're fragile in the case of Ryuho, and none of them have got airplanes. And so uh, the bottom line is that, yeah, Ozawa makes the the argument that, you know, okay, it's we need a bait force. Fine. You're going to you're telling me I'm going to run a bait force. I don't need all eight carriers to be sacrificed in this thing. You know, let's let's just go out there with four. And so the four that he takes out are the redoubtable Zuikaku, the last remaining unit from the Pearl Harbor attack force. And then, as you say, Bill, these three light carriers, Zuiho, Chitose, and Chiyoda, um, who are all con converted either from uh, seaplane or submarine tender hulls and have been put into service. Zuiho is actually the sister ship to Shoho, which was the light carrier uh, that was sunk at Coral Sea. She's a very fast, handy little unit, um, doesn't carry a big air group. But anyway, those are the quartet that are going to go out. One fleet carrier and these three light units. 
They've also got these um, <clears throat> these two hybrid carrier battleships, Issei and Huga. Um, so in the immediate aftermath of uh, the Battle of Midway, they were desperate for flight decks. And so they took in hand these two pretty old units from Bat Div 2 and decided to put flight decks on the rear ends of them, basically took turrets number five and six off, built up a flight deck, put some catapults on, and they are designed to be able to use uh, Judy dive bombers that have been reinforced for uh, being catapulted. And also they've got some scout planes on them as well. These are pathetic assets. Um, you know, the top end speed of these things is only 24, 25 knots. And so not exactly what you want to be bringing to a fast carrier battle. However, uh, both of them are actually going to play some a, a fairly important role in this bait force as, as the day goes on. The last thing I'd comment on is just, again, the paltry nature of the screen. The, these four carriers are screened by eight destroyers, just eight. Of those, four of them are these very capable Akazuki-class anti-aircraft destroyers. The other four, though, are these new Matsu-class, um, very hastily built, basically for anti-submarine work. They're kind of a destroyer escort on steroids. Um, so there's not a, a single fleet uh, fleet destroyer worthy of the name in this entire task force. It's it's Man, we have fallen on hard times here. That's kind of what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. I mean, hey, John, you said Yuga. Do they, are they do they launch float planes? Do, or are these planes land aboard? Um, no. OK, so the the Judy dive bombers would have to either land on a normal carrier or they'd have to bingo over to an airbase and land ashore. The the scout planes that they carry, which is the A-16E, I think it is, or the E-16A, maybe I got that transposed. Those are float planes that can then be hauled back aboard the carrier after their their scouting mission is over they're very they're very uh odd looking yeah. ducks th those two ships specifically they're very strange looking for sure yeah they really are yeah and, and as a child i mean they just fascinated me they were just like mm -hmm. again this is wow you know they got the cool pagoda mask they got the flight deck you know what's going on here um yeah, yeah they're they're guns they're, they're, Guns, yeah, guns. <laughs> so, guns. and those guns will be important later on, very late in the battle, as as we'll talk about. So, so Ozawa, as we said just a minute ago, was fully aware that his force was meat for Task Force Thirty Eight, and and as we alluded to earlier, he was in, he was not very pleased with the assignment. Um, do we have any kind of insight as to his mood on this mission? You know, we talked a lot about Kurita, Kurita when we did, um, which we call Samar, yeah, and Sabuyan Sea too, for that matter. But do yep. we have any insight as to what Ozawa was really thinking about all this? Uh, you know, you can pick up sort of oblique, um, oblique references, I guess I would say. I mean, Ozawa is one of the sharpest, uh, most on-the-ball admirals in the entire Imperial Navy. Uh, he's, a, he's a very shrewd guy. This is a guy who, frankly, probably should have been in command of their carrier force from day one. Uh, but because of Nagumo's seniority, Ozawa was passed over for command of, of Kido Butai. He's, a, he's a, a teacher of men. He's known for being very cordial to his men. He's not a, not a whip cracker. Um, He's tall, very tall for a Japanese. He's over six feet and, and notoriously ugly as well. But um, <laughs> yeah, which is terrible. They call him the gargoyle, you know, the gargoyle, <laughs> the gargoyle. Yeah. 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 Um, he had originally wanted to use his carrier force in a much more active way in support of this battle plan. The original battle plan was that he was going to take his carriers all the way down to Singapore uh, to be in the same anchorages that Kurita's center force was at down in Linga near Singapore. And then when the battle started, uh, his carrier force would be trailing behind Kurita and would provide active air cover over Kurita as he transits uh, Cebuian Sea and then goes down into Samar. And, you know, as you think back to last week about, you know, the enormous headaches that Kurita suffers as a result of these incessant air attacks from the Tathis, you know, having a, a hundred zeros overhead or something like that could have been really, really useful to the man. But 
the Formosa air battles destroy Ozawa's air groups. And so now he doesn't really have much in the way of aircraft to put on these, on these carriers. He's only got 118 ships or uh, planes, excuse me. So what he ends up doing then is he's going to, now he's put into a, a purely bait force role and, you know, his hands are tied. One of the things you can see at the end of this war is that Toyota is just, he's really got the whip hand on a lot of these Japanese admirals. They don't like this guy. They don't like his plans, but he is part of the, you know, the ultra militarist faction in Tokyo. And he is just, he's not accepting any, anybody saying no. So Ozawa is left with this bait force mission and he approaches it in the most uh, meticulous, careful way that he, that he can. Yeah, guys, I would say that, um, you know, some listeners are going to say, well, if it was a bait force, why did they have four aircraft carriers and why not fewer? It has to be big enough to be credible as a primary striking force, Thank but God. no bigger than necessary is the answer. So four is probably the right number based on the mission, sadly, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's there's a really interesting quote. Um, this book is very useful, Combined Fleet Decoded by John Fredos, uh, who just recently passed away, unfortunately. It's really good. Uh, the operational details you have to be careful with, but the, uh, he's really, he gives you sort of an insight into the workings of the Navy and the personalities there. And one of the, the things that he writes is that after the, the Formosa battles, uh, Ozawa realizes that, you know, he knew he would have to operate from Empire waters, would not be able to provide, provide air cover to anybody, and would only be able to operate as a decoy force. So he really is a sacrificial lamb. Yeah. And we talked about, uh, you talked about the size of the force, you know, four carriers and the two hybrids, and then you got, would you say, 118 aircraft, 118 aircraft. That's pretty I mean, pathetic. That's, that's the smallest carrier force that the Japanese have sent out, you know, by far in the war, I would say. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah in terms yeah. of aircraft. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, well, all, yeah. That's all I got left to him after, after yeah. Formosa. Yeah. yeah. You, These are, you got what you got. You got what you got. Exactly. Yeah. And the disparity between the two forces is, I mean, it couldn't be more stark, frankly. Yeah. Uh, task Force 38, while not whole, because again, remember task force or task group uh, 38.1 is still, all in tail back from Ulithi, uh, was absolutely overpowering. Um, compared to Ozawa's force, Halsey was bringing five fleet carriers, Intrepid, Franklin, Lexington, Enterprise, and Essex, as well as five CVLs, Independence, Bella Wood, Langley, Cabot, and San Jacinto. The six battleships of Willis Lee's battle line, eight cruisers, those are heavy, and, and light cruisers, and 41 destroyers. Uh, all of his carriers combined could amass between six and 700 aircraft compared to the 118 yeah. that the Japanese are bringing to the party. It's it's incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Remember, H.P. Wilmot made the comment in one of his books that in this particular battle, the Americans have more destroyers than the Japanese have carrier aircraft. <laughs> Think about that. Jesus. I never yeah. really thought about that, but that's yeah. that's yeah. I never thought about that. Incredible, yeah, incredible. Yeah. So, even though he is a decoy force, and he is, Ozawa gets one last chance to launch another carrier strike, and it's I made a big deal out of it in our notes because it's it's kind of sad, really. Honestly, yeah. it's the last Japanese carrier strike of World War II. Yeah. Think about that. These are the same cats who lit up Pearl Harbor, you know, tore Just us up in the sea. Indian yeah. Ocean, you know, like, yes. yeah, et cetera, et yeah. cetera. Yeah. Marched all over the Pacific, and here they are, the last carrier strike from the Imperial Japanese Navy during World War II. John, give us a little insight on, on this. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously there's some precursors to this, too. Sure. Um, you know, Ozawa's got to do his bait force thing first, and he is laboring under pretty poor intelligences to the timing of, you know, when is Corita actually going to come through San Bernardino and make his way down to Samar? As you know, both Corita's force does an about face in the middle of its operation, as does um, uh, Shima and Nishimura's force as well. You know, they take longer to get to where they're going. And so 
anyway, um, Ozawa sorties from the Inland Sea in Japan on the 20th of October and uh, starts making his way south. And we know that uh, we detect the the radio transmissions uh, from these, these various carriers coming together in the Inland Sea and rendezvousing and then sorting. So we've already got wind that there's at least one formation in the Japanese home islands that may be involved in this operation. Um, as Ozawa is coming south on the 22nd, he detects American radio transmissions that indicate to him that there are American carriers on a north-northwest course making their way towards him. And so on the assumption that uh, Corita is, is going to be coming, uh, you know, closing in on uh, San Bernardino, he decides on the 23rd then uh, that he is going to get his, his decoy on. And so he breaks radio silence uh, intentionally on the 23rd and is trying to make as much noise as he can. And the result is nothing. No American scouts find him. He's just he's just out there, you know, kind of kind of trailing his coats and nobody seems to care. Um, he's also starting to run low on fuel. And so what he ends up doing on that night, the night of the 23rd, 24th, is he decides to take Issei and Huga and push them out in front of his carriers as another one of these vanguard forces that we've seen at battles like Santa Cruz. It's, you know, again, just to say, look, guys, <laughs> Two big juicy battleships. Pay attention, you know. And so he does that on on the twenty fourth and puts them fifty nautical miles out ahead. Um, but it takes all day on the twenty fourth before the Americans finally get wind of the fact that he's there. Yeah, and and there there's several reasons for that, uh, you know. And and it's simply that the northernmost task group in Task Force thirty eight right now is uh, Ted Sherman's thirty eight point three. And again, if you recall, back to our Sabuyan Sea episode, Sherman's 38-3 is under air attack pretty much all morning long mm. from land-based aircraft coming from Luzon. So Sherman gets orders from Halsey that says, send some, go, go looking, you know, go basically go out on the hunt. But he can't do that at the moment that he receives those orders because his force is under aerial strike from these land-based aircraft. Mm -hmm. all damn morning long. So he's got a few things going on at that time, which is one of the reasons that he could not get people out there to go hunt for him. So Bill Ozawa receives that sighting report that John was talking about. He he receives that sighting report that they actually, the Japanese, find us first here. So tell us about what goes on here. Uh, crazy. This is the only, only ta Japanese task force that hasn't been sighted yet. Yeah, so right. they... But the Japanese have detected the Americans, Task, task Force 38. Uh, expecting an American scout to discover him at any time, he was rather surprised when one did not materialize. Ozawa, much like at Philippine Sea, was in the dark as to Japanese operations from land-based aircraft during Leyte Gulf. So these land-based aircraft that have been attacking the Americans, he doesn't know where they are or anything like that. No scouting report comes to him. So as Sherman's task group 38.3 was shooting away land-based aircraft or land-based strikes at 1245 american radar finally pick up an inbound flight of bogies coming in from the northeast based on the direction in which this radar contact is coming it could only be japanese and it could only have come from an aircraft carrier task force now i gotta believe that halsey is kind of overwhelmed at this point he thinks he's finally discovered the mother load this thing that he's been chasing all along yeah yeah that's probably right it there's a lot of things going on right now you know honestly yeah. there's a lot of things going on he 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 being halsey suspects that there is something brewing up to the north and when like bill was saying when this radar contact flicks on the screens it's a clear indication that there are japanese out there so that is in fact Japanese inbound, and it is in fact the final Japanese carrier strike of World War II. Ozawa takes the sighting report that was given to him by land-based aircraft when they discovered Task Force 38, and he says, you know what, before I send my people out there on what is more than likely going to be their last mission, I need to make sure yeah. that these guys are where they are 
theoretically supposed to be. And lo and behold, he sends his own strike or his own scouters out there, and they do find Task Force 38 again. And when they find them, they're 80 nautical miles away from the initial uh, location. So reported by the land based aircraft. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. So for I mean, Ozawa, it's probably a good thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this says a lot of a lot of very negative things about the professionality of of the Japanese pilots at this point. You know, we're essentially they're back to 1942 era standards of <laughs> of navigation and knowing where the hell the, the enemy force is when you actually send your transmission report. But anyway, mm-hmm. yeah. So once course. he once he gets a fix on the American carriers, he launches uh, he launched his scouts rather at at, at 10 hundred hours. Uh, and he received word a little over an hour later at 11.15 that the Americans had been spotted. And as I said, they were full 80 miles off. Um, the U.S. fleet is only 180 nautical miles away. So they're close. I mean, they're yeah. With the really close. strike range, yeah. Very much so. Very much so. Uh, that task group that was located, of course, is Sherman's 38.3. Um, so such was the state of, of Japanese naval aviation at this time, and I'm laughing, and I shouldn't be, yeah. but it's true. Ozawa knew that the strike he was launching from his carriers would more than likely never return. Of course, there are going to be a few, but the vast majority of his aviators, he was fully aware that these guys hadn't even been trained to land on a carrier, or if they had, they'd only done it maybe once, maybe. Yeah. So he was sending these guys on a one-way mission. Whether they were going to die or not, they more than likely weren't coming back to the carriers at all, if yeah. they survived. If yeah, survive. if they survive, they're gonna. Most of them are gonna end up bingoing over to Luzon and trying to land there because that's the only place they they can land. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm reminded of a of a a quote from again from H. P. Wilmot uh, from his book Empires in the Balance, and he he makes this quote about the fall of Singapore, and it's applicable here. That we have one of these situations where farce rubs elbows with pathos. Um, that this is just so sad, you know. The again, the demise of this once proud carrier force, and you have a pathetic number of aircraft and even fewer pilots in that strike force that can actually even land on an aircraft carrier. So, yeah, mm-hmm. how the mighty, how the mighty have fallen. <laughs> yep. Historians aren't supposed to be poets, John, and but he that was, was mighty. Po- yeah. 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 Wilmot. God, what a beautiful turn of phrase he so often had. But uh, yeah. Mm. Anyway, so they send this strike group up and uh, the sources are somewhat conflicting on the number of aircraft. It's around 70. 74 is the number I settled on per Prados. Um, 34 uh, bombers of various flavors and uh, 40 fighters. And that's that's what's going to be coming in against the Americans. Most of those aircraft are launched from Zuikaku, which makes sense. She's the biggest sure. of the flight decks there. Uh, yeah. So she sends up, uh, we think, uh, 10 zeros, 11 zero fighter bombers, six torpedo aircraft, and a couple of a uh, couple of recon planes. There are even some old Kate torpedo bombers in this mix. I mean, we are really scraping the barrel here uh, in terms of the aircraft that are being committed. Yeah, this is definitely... I mean, Kate was once a very good airplane, but by 1944, it was... No way. <laughs> not even close. Not yeah. even close. So as the strike makes its way towards the Americans, no surprise here, they are detected some 105 nautical miles out from 38.3 by USS Langley and her radar, uh, using what Cap was aloft, the fighter director uh, aboard Langley, a gentleman named Lieutenant John Montserrat, sent his ships four aloft Hellcats and a further eight from Essex towards the bogeys that are soon becoming bandits. Uh, As the Japanese near the inbound American task group, they are absolutely lit up by these few Hellcats. And again, this is 70-odd aircraft coming in, and they are hit by 12 American fighters. And these 12 American fighters just eat them up. Just dominate them. Yeah, yeah, they shoot down 19 aircraft, eight from Zuikaku and a further 11 from the other carriers, all within minutes. Damn. Now, Bill, the remaining aircraft, I mean, that's still 19 aircraft is shot down, but there's still quite a few up. They mm-hmm. they just kind of beat feet and bug out, don't they? Yeah, they, they break for the latest, the nearest land base as their remaining presence was not only noted by ships in Sherman's 38.3, after being smashed by the initial flight of Hellcats, 39 Japanese aircraft flew to Luzon, with one from Zuikaku flying all the way to Formosa. 
only three of the Japanese aircraft returned to the carriers Chitose and Chioda. Thus, the final Japanese carrier strike of the war ended with a whipper, inflicting no damage on the Americans, not even having pressed their attacks. Yeah, they Very, never, even, never even came yeah. within sight of our ships, it doesn't sound like. I mean, just, yeah, yeah. basically got... Again, I, <laughs> can I say it? Un, very un-Japanese. The dramatic difference between what Kido Butai yeah. had been in 42 compared to what the IJN fielded now is breathtaking. Yeah. Following the strike, Zawa's carriers boasted a grand total of 29 aircraft, 24 of those being fighters, guys. Yeah, yeah, that, that's... It's amazing. And, and I put a, a, a pause in the notes there because I figured we'd want to kind of talk about this because it, it is such a just such a ridiculous difference in, in, in what was there. It just shows you, like you said, John, last week and well, I said in the last several weeks that a complete lack of understanding uh, of the type of war that the Japanese bought for themselves is yeah. that they were just woefully unprepared for this attritional warfare that they sought out yeah and just uh, yeah I mean, this final strike uh yeah just the fact that uh basically they've to to quote another another great poet mike tyson you know everybody's got a plan until they get hit in the mouth you know <laughs> and uh and that's what happens here uh to this strike and they just you know these a dozen hellcats come in and just shoot the crap out of them and the remaining are just like what you know, screw this noise. We're we're going to Lausanne. Yeah. But yeah, these are not the same caliber aviators that you would have seen back in 1942 who would have pressed that attack. I mean, you know, there are no Murata's anymore. There are no Egusas anymore. There's no Kobayashi's. None of those, none of those cats are left at this point. These are greenhorns who've got 50 hours of stick time if and they just they just can't face up to this level of opposition and they just bug out and you can't really blame them john you know, were these guys kamikazes who who kind of um didn't they were just they, they were no. supposed to press a normal strike mission then yeah no this is this is a straight up by the book um you know you're going in to either dive bomb or launch torpedo attacks these are this is a conventional attack the first kamikaze attack has just occurred. I think it'll be this day against yes. San Lo. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, Seki's uh, squadron, which was hand-picked uh, by Admiral Onishi. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get into that. You know, it's, it's ironic because actually the first couple dozen or so kamikaze pilots are highly experienced aviators, including Seki, who's the guy that nails San Lo. Um, but you know, the, the cats that are flying from the carriers here, no, they were tasked with doing a conventional air attack and they failed miserably in that because they just didn't have the training to, to do their mission. And, you know, we talked about not the Japanese, not pressing their attack. And it is very true. They did not press their attack because there are no, no United States Naval records that indicate any kind of anti-aircraft activity from Task Group 38.3 on this day. In other words, Brooke they didn't even get within triple A range yeah. of the fleet, of the task group, yeah. for them to even fire their five inches at these things. So, I mean, these guys didn't even want to sniff those airplanes or those ships, man. They were gone. Yeah. They were absolutely gone. Yeah. Hey, Seth, before we start up again, I, I just got to say this for you folks on the audio, uh, listening on the audio program, Seth is wearing the ugliest shirt I've ever seen. What's up with that shirt, what? Seth? <laughs> I just I just realized this, maybe, that you guys are all wearing the same damn shirt. What is going oh, on? Maybe we actually... <laughs> no, 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 no. Can't possibly be true. That, no. There's no way I, I would put on a shirt as ugly as that. As ugly as that. Only partial know. wears shirts that ugly. That's what I know. Yeah. So hmm. anyway, it's hmm. weird. We have, we have, it's weird. We have, it's, we have partial disease. Is that what you're saying? Something like that. I don't know if it's <laughs> curable or not. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, yeah. oh my strange, very okay. odd. How did anybody convince you to put that shirt on? It's kind of a fractal design it again really for you is. on the opposite side, isn't it? <laughs> I don't and, know, Bill. Go look in the mirror, man. Okay. <laughs> egregious blues and reds. My goodness. 
Yeah, definitely <laughs> flashes with the wallpaper. That's all I can say. Anyway. Uh, and we stand out. But... Yeah. You're no longer in camouflage. That's true. Indeed. Indeed. Well, you know, as old ZZ Top says, everybody's crazy about a sharp dressed man. So anyway, so <laughs> moving on from there. Moving well, on us. from there. This no. is the episode of Poet, man. I'm telling you. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. There you go. So the dogfight, such as it was, with Ozawa's strike had confirmed, indeed, what Halsey had always thought, that Japanese carriers were indeed present, and they were probably somewhere in the Northeast. Uh, after finally shooing away the last of the Japanese aircraft, 38-3 under Sherman, do launch their scouts at 14.05 and point them Northeast, Avengers and Helldivers were all Sherman could spare because he was afraid of a potential another round of Japanese aerial assaults coming from Luzon or these carriers, and he had every right to be because he didn't know what the hell was coming around next. So he sends out Avengers and Helldivers to go hunt for the Japanese. At 1640, uh, Sherman scouts spot Ozawa, now some 190 nautical miles away. Uh, it was too late in the day to launch a strike from Task Force 38, so Halsey, concerned that Ozawa could open the distance overnight, made the controversial decision to chase him north. Concerned about the Japanese tendency to shuttle bomb, and John, we can get into this in a second, Halsey wanted to hit the carriers before they had a chance to launch another attack on 38. So you've already launched, theoretically, one attack on Task Force 38, Task Group 38-3, even though they didn't get anywhere near them. Halsey always said that he wasn't, you know, convinced that they didn't have other aircraft in their hangars, and he was convinced that they were going to shuttle bomb him. Now, what would lead him to think that? You know, the Japanese have done it occasionally, but it was not like this was a consistent tactic of theirs, was it? No, but I, I think what you're seeing here is that in, in the most recent carrier battle, it was a sure. tactic. It's the kind of thing you can do if you have uh, land, you know, airstrips close by, and the Japanese certainly do. So he's he is concerned about that. The other thing I put in the notes here um, is that to, to give Halsey a little bit more of a pass, uh, the intel that he had been fed by some of the Pacific Fleet uh, intel agencies was that the Japanese probably were bringing three fleet carriers and one light carrier, as opposed to exactly the opposite, you know, one fleet and three lights. Um, he's under the impression that Amagi and Katsuragi may have been in commission and active and with air groups. And so uh, that's that's the information he feels that he's running on at this point. Even with that, um, you know, the difference between three fleet and one light and one light and three fleet ain't all that great in terms of the aggregate uh, count of aircraft if, if, if Halsey knows that he's got 10 carriers of his own. Uh, so, yeah, anyway. Yeah, so... No surprise here. He wants to wipe the Japanese completely off the map, which is what he's supposed to do. It is literally in the man's orders to, if the opportunity should arise, to strike and wipe them off the map. Uh, and for that to happen, he feels like he needs to close the range even more, which probably doesn't, but he wants to do that regardless. Um, and I put in the notes, he wants to keep the big blue conveyor belt over the top of uh, Ozawa all day long. And we talked about this last week as well. Most of Halsey's staff, which we call, you know, Mac called his people the Batan Gang. Yeah. Halsey called his people the Numea Gang. And, of course, if you were recalled, Halsey and Mac. New actually, yeah, well, they, but they got along well, you know, so it wouldn't, mm -hmm. it's not no real surprise here. Uh, most of Halsey's staff, the Numea Gang, as we were talking about, all told the boss that he should take the whole fleet north. And this is in the records. I mean, they're they're all saying, yep, yeah, boss, let's go. Let's go bring everybody to the party and go up there and just go, you know, do this thing. Um, Halsey points to a spot on the map and tells his chief of staff, Mick Carney, here's where I'm going, Mick, start them north. And, of course, that is the decision that leads to Taffy 3's ordeal, yeah. shall we say, off of, uh, off of Samar. Yeah. Now, Bill, these guys are cruising. Task Force 38 mm -hmm. is moving and they're heading north all night long. Tell us about what's going on in the uh, in the meantime here. Yeah, you know, by the way, Seth, his orders are to destroy the fleet, but he preferentially wants to destroy the carrier fleet. That's kind of sure. the problem here. Very so true. Task Force 38 closed the distance on the decoy fleet rather quickly at 25 knots. The goal was to reach 
optimum launch point by first light. All the carriers had been instructed to fuel and arm their aircraft during the night, spot the deck, and put the planes in the spots where they're going to launch from, and prepare for a dawn launch. The enemy's exact position would come later. Halsey wanted his birds airborne as soon as possible. So in the meantime, Task Force 34, the much-desired battleship force that Kincaid was assuming would come to his rescue, was formed. The world wonders where they were, though. Yet the task force under Ching Li was not sent to San Bernardino Strait, as previously discussed. They were sent out ahead of the carriers at a position roughly 10 miles ahead of the rest of Task Force 38. Lee's battle wagons in Task Force 34 and cruisers plowed the seas, ready to destroy the cripples left by the carrier strikes and not Corita, who Taffy 3 was about to discover. Yes. Yeah, you know, and again, and again, and we don't need to pile on because we did that last week. But just you got to you got to sit here and say you got to think about it. You got six battleships, fast battleships, premier ships of their type in the entire world. And you got a whole bunch of cruisers. These cruisers could deal and destroyers could deal with any cripple out there, any cripple out there at all. These cruisers and destroyers can handle that easy, easy, easy. Send yep. those big girls back and let them go do what they need to do or what they were designed to do. Well, it's interesting here, too, because we'll recall from the episode on uh, the rain on a truck that Spruance, you know, had his own afternoon of of battleship gunnery fetishness, you know, when he wanted to be, yeah. you know, shooting at some cripples. Um, and here we see the same thing sort of manifesting itself uh, with, with Halsey as well. I, Yeah, it. In light of hindsight, it seems pretty inexplicable, but here we are. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense at all, but as you said, here we are. So, John, you can know, I poke Robert Frost here, death by fire, death by ice? Yes. Is death sweeter battleship? I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right? You know, you know yeah, Ching I shouldn't Lee, joke about these things. You, you know Ching Lee had to be just sitting there going, God. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, and but he has done everything he can do. He is, yes. you know, made two interrogatory transmissions to Halsey, you know, to say, are you sure you want me to be doing this? And it's pretty clear that this is what the boss wants to do. So uh, none of the responsibility for the debacle that happens around the Taffies needs to stop by Ching Lee's binnacle. Um, <laughs> you know, he had nothing to do with this. This is... This is all Halsey and his staff. Yeah, yeah. So as the sun rose, so did the American aircraft, 180 of them, which, and we can get into this in a few minutes. That's a small force, really, launching from Task Force 38. That's a small force. 180 aircraft is not what you would expect this group to be throwing out. Um Unsure of Ozawa's whereabouts, but knowing they were close, Mitcher ordered his aviators to orbit 50 miles north of Task Force 38. Fuel would not be an option or would not be a problem this day as they were they knew that the Japanese were relatively close. Now, kind of odd. Tensions started to creep up a little bit when they couldn't find them. <laughs> they, they sent scouts out there and they can't find the damn people. Like, where the hell did they go? Yeah. Uh, they were unable to locate them, but at 0710, more than an hour after launch, a Hellcat from USS Essex spots the enemy carrier force now only 150 miles away, headed northeast at 20 knots. Close as they were and already airborne, the American strike aircraft are going to be on top of them momentarily, honest to God. It literally is less than an hour. So, John, you were talking about the fleet, how it was arrayed. Yeah, and Japanese we have some, some fairly... I don't want to. I don't want to badmouth anybody else's drawings. They're they're somewhat rudimentary. Um, the bottom line is that Ozawa's force at this point is concentrated in basically a single unit, uh, heading roughly north. So he's got all of his carriers. He's got a battleships there. What few escorts are around them are all concentrated in a glop. Um, that is going to change as the attacks are ongoing through the day. Eventually, they're going to be pulled apart into two rough group, the lead group uh, consisting of the big Zuikaku 
the battleship Hyuga and uh, light carrier uh, Zuiho. And then the second group is going to be the other light carriers. So Chitose, Chiyoda, uh, Hyuga's sister Issei, another couple of light cruisers and their quartet of destroyers. So the Japanese are not stupid. They know that, that there's a strike. Probably. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. one coming sooner or later. They crank it up to about 24 knots. Which is um, the top end of those battleships. I mean, this is as fast as this force can go. So yeah, they're out there with the oars. Yeah, they're they're paddling. Yeah. Um Japanese radar picks up the American strike at 080 or 0804, and a paltry four zeros are launched as combat air patrol. Uh, they were soon joined by a further nine more. As the Americans drew near, no surprise here, they spot Ozawa at 0810. The American strike is led by fighter ace David McCampbell. We talked about him a little oh, while ago. And he assigned the targets and began to organize uh, the strike according to their target assignments. Bill, tell us uh, about uh, the, the Japanese cap and what's going on in these first initial engagements here. Well, the Japanese cap, such as it was, sped to the intercept point. The escorting Hellcats never gave the Japanese a chance, intercepting them before they ever got close to strike. Essex fighters claimed nine of the Japanese combat air patrol, losing one Hellcat in the process. The others were either scattered or shot down. Without any cap for the remainder of the day, as none would be launched, the Japanese carrier force was carrying for the circling American vultures that would come throughout the day. So devoid of cap, the Japanese formations began to come apart, as you would expect. The ships dancing wildly on the ocean surface, attempting to avoid or throw off the American attacks. Japanese AAA, however, was very heavy. According to the first strikers in the fleet, American pilots stated that both Issei and Hyuga opened fire with their main batteries yeah. on the incoming strike, their Type 3 shells exploding the air in multi-colored clouds. The remainder of the Japanese formation also poured fire at the Americans. And while the aviators said the fire was very heavy, they also said it was wildly inaccurate, guys. Yeah, and, you know, the Japanese, com uh, not combat air patrol, the Japanese AAA has never been accurate. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, it's never been it's no, we're not not saying that ours, the American AAA is accurate all the time. But with the proximity fuse and the sheer amount of lead that we can throw in the air, something's going to get hit. Whereas the Japanese, they never really seem to grasp this whole AAA thing throughout the whole damn war. Um, yeah, and I, you know, a lot of this is it's it's really difficult within the time frame of a war to introduce a new weapon. You know what they needed was. Uh, a lot of uh, licensed built bofers. I mean, that's the thing that they're really missing here is a good medium caliber automatic, and they've just never had it. Um, I will say that uh, the anti-aircraft destroyers that they have with them, the Akazukis, are some of the finest little AA platforms, naval AA platforms of the war. They are armed with an extremely good 3.9 inch 100 millimeter um gun they got eight of them a piece they're very quick firing weapons um and so these are good little ships but i think a lot of what's going on here is you've got a lot of pretty inexperienced crewmen in the mix that they just don't really know what they're doing and uh as far as their light anti-aircraft weapon the 25 millimeter uh which is a knockoff of the french hotchkiss you know i've everybody and their brother who you know, knows anything about the Japanese Navy, I'll tell you, this is just not a very good gun. Uh, it's a clip-fed, top-mounted top clip-fed weapon. And the box uh, for the ammo is not very big, so you're constantly yoinking the box off to put a new one on the top. Uh, for a lot of the twin mounts, the Japanese gunner's habit was, well, I fire with one barrel until it runs out. And then while they're switching the ammo on that barrel, I fire with the other barrel, you know, so I'm only getting half of the cyclic rate out of that mount that I should be getting, as opposed to the Bofors, as long as I keep dropping, you know, clips in the in the gravity feed on this thing, this sucker fires, you know. So, yeah, there, there's a combination of, I would say, technical factors in their weapons, which are 
in some cases, really suboptimal, combined with crewmen who really are not at the top of their game at this point in the war. And yeah, they put a fair amount of lead up in the air, but a lot of it ends up going in places where it's unneeded. Yeah, yeah. Well, as the American attack unfolds, it unfolds according to the doctrine that these guys had been putting into practice or frankly developing since 1942. Uh, the Hellcats come in, they start strafing the Japanese ships while other Hellcats orbit and search for any aerial opposition that may have initially slipped past them, which, as far as I could find, was nothing. Yeah. Uh, after the strafers make their runs, and the strafers are coming down, they're not going to do any damage to the ships. What they're trying to do is kill those anti-aircraft gunners that you're talking about, John. They're trying right. to, to just lay Slaughter. those guys down. Yeah. Yep. And in most cases, they do that. They do. Um after the strafers make their runs, the hell divers drop on the Japanese fleet, and then the Avengers come in. Uh, the targets for the initial strike were the carriers, and no surprise here, Zuikaku being the biggest flight deck in the whole group is going to be the main target. Uh, Intrepid's hell divers make the first runs on Zuikaku, followed by what I called, well, not I, but the Navy called the Evil Eye, uh, and more Avengers from San Jacinto. Uh, at roughly 0830, Zui Kaku is hit by three bombs from Intrepid's air group. All three smash through her flight deck, port side midships. One starts a fire in the hangar deck, and minutes later, Zui Kaku is hit by an Intrepid launch torpedo. Uh, she takes this hit in her port side between her number two and three elevator. Her generator rooms flood. She takes a list, but again, and John, we you want to get into this. This this is the most experienced carrier in the Japanese fleet, and she kind of shrugs this off. Yeah. Yeah, she does. No, you're absolutely right. You know, Zui Kaku obviously has been around the block at this point. She has a very good crew. Um, yes, she takes a torpedo hit. They counter flood uh, pretty quickly and, and then start dewatering that space. The The bomb hit on the hangar deck that causes the fire is put out relatively quickly. And to the Japanese credit, by the time you get to late 1944, they too have understood the importance of damage control, and they do actually put some effort into training their crews a little bit better, and Zuikakus is one of the best. The bad news for her is that as a result of these hits on the torpedo side, one or the port side, one of her propeller shafts is completely destroyed. It's bent, so they cannot, they'll never get that shaft running again. And so by the end of this first attack, she's still able to make pretty decent speed, but she is only under propulsion with her two starboard shafts. Um, and that's going to that's gonna be problematic, obviously, as things continue to unfold. So, Bill, Zui Kaku is not the only ship hit in this attack, is she? No, she's not. Air Group 20 from the legendary carrier, carrier Enterprise, your favorite ship, Indeed. Pulled into view of the Japanese fleet, the Big E's hell divers passed up Zuikaku, who was already under attack and focused on Zuiho. Zuiho had been attacked by Enterprise flyers before, two years ago, at the Battle of Santa Cruz. Bernie Strong and his wing wingman, Chuck Irvine, each planted a bomb on the small carrier, rendering her mission kill in October of 42. But now she's back. Now, Big E dive bombers lined up on Zuiho again. Coming in from 12,000 feet, Emmett Rivera led his seven hell divers down through, as he described it, light AAA. The lead aircraft dropped their 1,000-pound bombs and near-missed the carrier with three bombs. The second to last Big E hell, hell diver to drop on Zuiho scored. The 1,000-pounder smacked the light carrier in the after section of her flight deck. That bomb caused the rear section of the flight deck to bulge and lifted the elevator out of its well. By 0855, Zuiho's fires were out, good damage control again, mm -hmm. and her slight list had, list had been corrected, but so she wasn't dead yet, Seth. Now, as, as the American attack progresses and is still going on, David McCampbell assigns his own Essex Air Group to attack Chitose. Uh, this attack by Essex Air Group is by far the most successful uh, of this first American, first of many American raids this day. Uh, Essex's hell divers claimed an astonishing eight hits, which, as we know, ain't the case. 
I don't think that with the exception of Gaga, that was probably never the case, frankly. Uh, <laughs> and yet only near misses rattled the ship. However, Chitose was struck by Essex, Essex, Essex's Avengers, who planted three fish in her port side near her number one elevator. Can you get into Chitose's ordeal here, John? This is it's it's pretty, pretty. Grisly. It's ugly. Um, these are these are small ships. I mean, these these are these are barely light cruiser sized, you know, hulls that they're that they're founded on in the first place. And also, if you look at the just the hull design on these things, they are optimized for speed. So they don't have, you know, big, sophisticated underwater protection systems, even to a cruiser level standard. So, yeah, any sort of torpedo damage is just going to be really bad for them. Um, her two port side boiler rooms are immediately flooded by this damage, and she takes an alarming uh, 27 degree list to port. They managed to correct that back to 15 degrees, and she's under power for at least some amount of time. But there's progressive flooding going on here that they can't seem to control. And by 0925, she goes dead in the water, and now she's listing at 30 degrees, which is get off the ship. This thing is, is capsizing, you know. Um, and yet, despite all that, uh, Rear Admiral Matsuda, who's on Huga, uh, orders the light cruiser Isuzu to take her under tow, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Um, and before that order can even be carried out, 0937, uh, Chitose rolls onto her port side and takes down 903 officers and men, leaving about 600 men in the water. You know, it's stark. When these Japanese ships go down, they take a lot of human beings. Moses. Yes, they do. I mean, <laughs> it's like every single time. I mean, and, and by contrast, I mean, obviously, there are American ships where there's a lot of casualties. Indianapolis, Juno, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, Franklin. Franklin, yeah. But, but, but I mean, when we do no. lose ships, we get people off in a, yes. in a pretty – you know, reasonable amount of time, and a lot of these guys survive. Obviously, there are you know instances where they don't, but almost every single time, man, these guys lose just tremendous amounts of people when these Big things go yeah. yeah, and I, I I don't necessarily have an explanation for it. I'm yeah. yeah, I well, I do actually. I mean, some of it is that I think in a lot of cases they're very tardy in ordering abandoned ship. Sure. I mean, as soon as, you know, if this thing is listing 30 degrees at 0925, get off the ship. It's time to get off the ship. It's clearly time to get yeah. off the ship, you know, and they just yeah. they don't they don't make that happen. And we're going to see some more instances of this as this as this afternoon continues. So it's not uncommon in American airstrikes that when a flock of aircraft attack a carrier and hit it, most aviators still aloft think that it's dead and they right. choose other targets for their ordnance. This is no different. Uh, Bella Wood and San Jacinto Avengers attacked Ozawa's escorts, hit bo hitting both light cruiser Tama and cruiser Oyoto. Uh, Tama took one fish hit, that hit her, excuse me, in the boiler room, heavily damaged. She proceeds to Okinawa at 14 knots. Oyoto suffers minor damage from a near miss and a rocket attack. This is not the only attack of the day, quite the opposite. It's just the first. Bill, tell us about the second and third waves coming in at 0945. Well, Mitcher's second attack, only 36 aircraft from Lexington and Franklin converged on the area. These aircraft mostly focused on Chiyoda. David McCampbell, still aloft, ordered the fresh aircraft to attack the undamaged carrier as Ozawa's force was now in complete disarray. BB-13 from Franklin board in on Toyota. Franklin's CAG, Carrier Group Commander, Commander Richard Kibbe, led the strike from Big Ben. Corralling the, his hell divers, Kibbe organized his flight to dive on Toyota from about 14,000 feet. Franklin's bombers claimed four hits, and for once, they were pretty accurate in their claims. Toyota is rattled by near misses, that rupture her hull, and she takes a direct hit from a 1,000-pounder near the port quarter of her flight deck. Big Ben's hell divers wrecked the little carrier as she assumed a 13-degree list to starboard and drifts to a stop dead in the water, Seth. Yeah. this Her fate is even nastier, John. Yeah. Tell us about 
Chiota. This is bad, bad. Yeah, so we don't really have a lot of uh, direct information on her damage profile because none of her crew survives this battle. Um, so basically, if you look at her tabular record of movement on on my website, um, all you have is is just a collection of observations by the other ships that are around her and what they see happening. But the, the bottom line is, yes, she's taken this 13-degree list uh, to starboard. She's been hit by multiple bombs and maybe some torpedoes as well. Um, by 0925, she reports that she is operating just on diesel power and expects that she's not going to survive for much more than five hours. Light cruiser Isuzu uh, was initially detached to tow her, but it, it's when she gets there, it's pretty clear that that tow is just not going to work. And then uh, the report comes in that uh, that Chitose needs a tow, and so Isuzu leaves the neighborhood to go and tow uh, Chiyoda's sister instead, and that's the last time a Japanese ship is actually going to see this carrier. Eventually, what ends up happening is she comes under the guns of some of these American uh, surface ships, including uh, the New Orleans and the Wichita and nine U.S. destroyers. The American accounts make it clear that uh, that Chiyoda fights back. She actually returns fire with some of her five-inch guns against the Americans, but at 1655, she rolls on her beam ends and sinks, and despite the fact that there are swarms of Japanese crewmen seen, you know, getting off of the ship, you know, repelling down her sides and into the water, the Americans declined to rescue any of those survivors. A little bit later, the dis Japanese destroyer, Hatsuzuki, is going to be ordered back to look for her survivors and runs into the same American surface group and is sunk with all hands. So, you know, that's probably 1,300 guys, maybe 1,400 uh, that all die on, on board that carrier. Yeah, again, yeah, yeah. again. So the third American attack of the day is by far the largest. It is launched at 1145. It arrives over the Japanese between 1310 and 1400. And it's because they're coming in in, in gaggles, if you will. Um, some 200 American aircraft are involved in this strike. It is the most effective of the day by far. Uh, the majority of the aircraft taking part in this third attack also took part in the first attack that morning and are inbound to finish what they started. Um, you know, I put it in the notes, we might want to talk about the relative ineffectiveness of the first large attack of the morning. And I don't want to say it's ineffective in the, that they didn't hit anything, because obviously they do. But again, this goes back to what we've talked about through almost all of these episodes. These guys are friggin' tired. They are mm. smoked. And, and the fact that you put out 100 and what, 180 aircraft in your first strike, your second strike is only 36, and this is your biggest, and you got some 200 aircraft. This is from Task Force 38, world's most powerful naval force. Right. And... You're not, you know, you own the skies. There is no Japanese opposition in the skies. You own the sky. Yes, there's AAA, but it's not, as we've discussed, it ain't that accurate. And it's growing less and less by the hour. And you're still not just waylaying these people as you think that you would. And I attribute this to absolute just sheer exhaustion on these guys' parts. These guys have been flying for weeks at a time and, and day after day after day, mission after mission. I think they're just exhausted. I don't know. But the, the results are obviously good at the end of the day, but it takes us all day kind of to gear get up. these things. In, yeah, to get these they things They just might control. not have had enough coffee in the first strike wave. I don't know. <laughs> you know something's going on there. Yeah, it, you're right, because I'm sort of fast forwarding in my mind. Um to battleship Yamato's demise in Ten Ichigo, which is going to happen in April of 45, and we'll be talking about that, and just the almost the clinical precision with which she is executed. And yeah, mm -hmm. it stands in contrast to this. Yeah, I don't have an explanation. I think yours yeah. is as credible as any. Yeah, these guys are pooped. What about so. you, Bill? What do you think? You, yeah, they, they they've been flying even though they haven't been striking. And because you get combat air patrols up. You know, there, there were, were there flights in support of the landings? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the only thing that makes sense, Seth, that they are just completely exhausted, if not physically, but mentally. mentally, psychologically. Yeah. Um, this is just one of those things that, you know, 
do we really need to be doing this? I mean, that can weigh on you when you're sent in to do, is this just, or, or you know, to, to what extent is, do we keep having to, to nail this coffin shut? And yeah, maybe I'm going to hang back a little bit. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to press. This. Yeah. I'm not going to press my attack run, you know, to the absolute limit because I know I've got a lot of planes in the sky. And if I don't get it done at this strike, the next one is, you know, yep. I maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, there, there's a picture from, I believe. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's this day and it's in, I don't remember which carrier it is. I'll, look it up and I'll put it in the video here. And it's, it's in one of the ready rooms of these, uh, of one of the fleet carriers. I want to say it's intrepid, but I could be wrong. And these guys, you look at the pilot, you look at their faces. It's all a room full of guys. And these guys look like zombies. They do. I mean, they look like zombies. I mean, it's a black and white photo and you can tell these guys got circles under their eyes for days. I mean, yeah. these dudes are absolutely wiped out. They yeah. are done. Just absolutely done. Regardless, they're still going to fly until they get these guys under the water. McCampbell, David McCampbell, lands back aboard Essex and turns his air coordinator job over to a gentleman named Commander Theodore Winters from USS Lexington CV-16. Winters looked at the formation of Japanese ships and see how, sees how strung out they are. And he decides to parcel out his attack much like McCampbell did. Zui Kaku and Zui Hu are proceed, proceeding north with a battleship along with them, and Chioda was south on fire and listing badly. Winters sent Essex, Lexington, and Langley after the two remaining Japanese aircraft carriers. Lexington's birds focus on Zuikaku. Zuikaku speeds up to 24 knots, which is rather amazing considering when you're only working on two shaft. After, yeah, yeah, that's, that's top end. Well, yeah. those carriers, oh my God, I, I forget the number of shaft horsepower those things put out. I think it's about 160,000 shaft. I mean, these... Shokaku and Zuikaku, I'm sorry, were just the, the the two finest carriers that Navy ever built. And they have these big, glorious, expensive <laughs> propulsion plants. And yeah, so this is top end for that ship on two shaft, but she's able to make 24 knots. It's pretty impressive. It really is, you know, considering the beating she's already taken, but there's yeah. more beating to come. Yeah. Lexington's Hell Divers, of course, claim a lot of hits. Uh, all they get are near misses, but her Avengers are the ones that actually plant the seed of yeah big time big time uh the avengers as i put in the notes disembowel zui kaku here she takes at least that we know of six lexington torpedoes yep. two on her starboard side and four on her port can you tell us about her yeah. death here classic hammer and anvil attack and it just works to a t and they just absolutely crush uh zui kaku and really just just yeah as you say disembowel is exactly the right word um the result of this is irreversible flooding happening in multiple places within her hull even though it is a big beefy hull and has fairly good anti-torpedo protection not against six hits it doesn't um so she's got also three bombs hit her during the same attack that reignite some of these hangar fires takes on a pronounced port list um and what ends up happening then is finally when the list gets bad enough, the captain, uh, a guy named Kazuka, uh, orders not abandon ship, but we have to take down the flag. You know, so there is this elaborate ceremony and there are famous photographs sure. taken on this badly listing aircraft carrier of hundreds and hundreds of guys standing on her flight deck saluting as we reel down her ensign and get the Imperial portrait out of the wardroom and God only knows what else, um, before they finally announce at 1358 an abandoned ship. And she sinks just 16 minutes later, taking down the captain, uh, Kaizuka, 48 officers and 794 petty officers and men along with her. You wasted a half an hour standing around on the flight deck when you could have gotten those guys down in the water and gotten them rescued. And then this is the one that just breaks me. Dudes, what are you thinking about? Come on. Yeah. I, again, the contrast between uh, the abandonment here and what happened to Lexington and Coral Sea 
where you've got all the, you know, the, the famous pictures of all those guys shinnying down the ropes into the water. Yep. And how many, how many people did we lose off of Lexington? It Just was a over few. 100. Yeah. yeah, something like that. But, you know, this is an enormous carrier that was on fire stem to stern. And we still got, you know, the vast majority of her crew off. And this could have happened here with Zui Kaku. And instead, because of the captain's need for theatrics, you end up killing more than 800 of your sailors. It's just, it's just, just, yeah. Anyway, I can't even go yeah. there. No, it's no, it's, it's it's stupid is it's what it stupid. is. It's, it's stupid. stupid. It's just absolutely stupid. Yeah. So Zui Kaku is done for. And, you know, she is the last of the six that attacked Pearl Harbor. So there's something final about the whole yeah. thing. You know, there really is. There really mm -hmm. is. So, yeah. I mean, you want to. Yes. From a functional standpoint, uh, the Battle of Philippine Sea marks the end of the Japanese carrier force. But from an emotional standpoint, seeing Zui Kaku go down, uh, that really puts the the nail on the head, you know, as far as this carrier force really is done, done. Oh, yeah. Big time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big time. Bill, uh, tell us about Zui Ho. Yep. So Winters orders the rest of his inbound strike to hit Zuiho, who at this time, according to the Americans, is pounding along seemingly unharmed. Although we know she has been hit already, she ain't dead yet, to quote Monty Python. <laughs> Franklin, Big E, and San Jacinto swoop in to finish Zuiho off. The first attack wave comes at 1330, and frankly, from all the aircraft attacking her at once, it's almost impossible to say who hit her and where. So, John, what do you think's going down here? Uh, uh, this is uh, sort of the the light carrier version of the smashing that happens to Kaga. I mean, you know, she's being swarmed by so many planes. Um, yeah, who knows what ends up happening? And again, there are some very famous photos of Zuiho taken during this battle uh, from the earlier portions where, yeah, she is apparently steaming along pretty well. But the result is, yeah, she takes three near misses off of her stern. She takes another direct hit on her aft flight deck with a 500-pound bomb that lifts the elevator up and uh, bulges off the flight deck, which is sort of irrelevant at this point. She puts her fires out by 0855, but now this big strike that comes in at 1330 just absolutely crushes her. Uh, a torpedo hit, another small bomb forward, and seven near misses, um, which then another set of bombers come in and put what some accounts say was 60 near misses. I find that not credible, but probably dozens. And the result of all of that is even if you're not hitting this ship directly, you're opening her seams and popping the rivets and doing what else. And so she is now taking on progressive flooding. Uh, number two boiler room uh, to port is flooded. Then the port engine room goes as well. She's dead in the water by 1445 with a 13 degree list to starboard. And the fourth and final attack of the day, which we haven't talked about yet, is going to hit her with yet more near misses. 1500, her list is up to 23 degrees. The imperial portrait is transferred and down she goes at 1526 by the CERN with only... 214 men, uh, they rescue about 760. So this is the best showing that we've had today of, uh, you know, the number of Japanese guys that get pulled out of the water, and it's only uh, 214 men being lost. Well, honestly, I mean, 214 lives to 214 lives. But when you look at the, the pounding, pounding that she took, took. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that's frankly not that bad. You know, when you consider the ordinance that she absorbed, and yes, how many how many did Kaga lose? Do you remember off the top of your head? Eight hundred and eleven, I believe. There you go. Yeah, there you go. And the majority of those died in the fires, uh, right. and as a result of the initial bomb hits. And there's certainly some on Zuiho that suffered the same. Um, you know, you take a torpedo hit in an engine room that has mm -hmm. no effective anti-torpedo system that room you know that that space floods right now and all yep. the guys in it drown that's just how that works so there's undoubtedly some of those 200 men were were direct casualties of the damage that are inflicted to her 
So for the remainder of the day, uh, American aircraft are attacking what's left of this Japanese force with some success, but nothing major. Uh, the main targets, that, which are the carriers, are dead. Um, dive bombers from Essex attacked Issei, near missing her four times. The final attack of the day is commanded by a gentleman named Commander Malcolm, Malcolm Wardell from USS Langley. He told his aviators to attack whatever they could find. Basically, just go after whatever's floating and hit it. Uh, there was little to no coordination in this last strike as the day was drawing to an end. Wardell just wanted to get his people back aboard the flight decks. It was very obvious that yeah. this fight was over. Um, some ships were hit again. Issei was hit again, theoretically. Anyway, the hit was not lethal at all. Um, Ozawa's force is absolutely wrecked. It's absolutely destroyed. All four carriers had been sunk as well as a destroyer. Major damage to a cru cruiser, various degrees of damage to other ships. Over 500 sorties had been flown against those hours since 0730. So, you know, the big blue fleet does pick up the pace a little bit towards the end of the day. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, the results, yes, we sunk four Japanese aircraft carriers, but there's nothing to sneeze at, albeit they were empty. Yeah. And the aircraft, anti-aircraft fire was virtually nil by the end of the day. I still say that the results were relatively wanting you know considering the amount of flights that were flown that day against basically a sitting duck force but yeah so um task force 34 let's talk about this very briefly wrap the sucker up uh we know that halsey turned his battle wagons around to try and catch Corita. uh he left the cruisers under rear admiral lawrence debose around to clean up the cripples left behind by the carrier strikes Four cruisers and 12 destroyers headed north to sink Chioda, as you were talking about a little while ago, John, and anything else they may encounter. As the Bose's force, led by USS Santa Fe, CL-60, which we'll talk about in the future, USS Franklin, uh, came into view. Japanese cruiser Isuzu, who was standing by Chioda, as I put in the notes, hauled ass. Yeah, time to go. She yeah. didn't want any part of that. Yeah. Uh, USS Wichita CA-45 opened fire from 19,000 yards on Chioda, and after 15 minutes, Chioda was a mass of flames. Bill, um, it, after they hit Chioda, it's still, they're still chasing after the remnants of these Japanese surface forces, aren't they? Yeah, they are. So du DuBose closed in on the remnants of the Japanese destroyer foes force and opened fire on Hatsuzuki, at a range of 28,000 yards. Not surprisingly, because of the range, the American fire missed the target. Finally, after shooting at Hatsuzuki for what seemed like forever, a hit was scored. The plucky little destroyer put up a good fight, but was overrun by the American cruisers who absolutely pummeled her with eight and six inch gunfire. This confirms what you said earlier, Seth, about the fact that this is the, the, the surface action force that should have been kept with the carriers, the American carriers, uh, when the, while the battleship force should at least battleships should have been sent south, Task Force 34, to San Bernardino Strait. This proves that it would have worked. I'm sure Halsey wanted to declare a major victory here. And I'm sure he's also learning about what's happening to the south of him that's going to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory as it, you know, as the rest of the American leadership will perceive it, Seth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, John, little, you were little, saying that... Yeah, yeah that, I was just going to say there's a little-known sort of post-quill to this, that when Ozawa finds out that, you know, there's an American surface action group picking on his cripples, he actually detaches Issei, Huga, Oyodo, the light cruiser, and his remaining destroyers to turn back south to bring that task group under its guns. And, uh, you know, fortunately for DeBose, he turns back after having sunk Hatsuzuki and moves to the south. And as a result, the Japanese surface action group never cites anything, and they then turn around and head back north. But there's a sort of a fascinating what if, you know, if, if a pair of American heavy cruisers and some destroyers run into a pair of 14-inch gun-armed uh, Japanese battleships and change. Who walks out of that engagement better off? I don't think it's DuBose. So yeah. to me, that's just another indication of the mismanagement of this battle on the part of Halsey. I mean, you can sink cripples with airplanes, guys. You don't need to do it with, with surface warships. I, You know, 
Uh, and you've had ample opportunity throughout this day to cite those hybrid battleships. You know that the enemy has yeah, heavy you know they're gun there. arm. You know they're there. So, you know, there was the potential here that it could have gone even worse for Halsey if DuBose had continued north and Huga and Issei had continued south. You know, that would have been another really black eye um, as far as Halsey was concerned. I, I think if that happens, Halsey does get relieved. I really do. Yeah. If those two battle wagons come into view and sink one or two or of more, those cruisers, that's your ass, Jack, because you you've you've been so indecisive. Right. I mean, we always say Halsey's decisive, and he was. He's like carriers, boom, let's go. But with the battleships, with Lee's battleships, he's like, he sends them along and he turns them around, and all of a sudden, you know, it's it's. Yeah, pick one, you know, pick right. one and stick with it. E either either you send the task force 34 out there to go send, to sink the cripples or you send them back to San Bernardino Strait. Pick one. I don't think he it. would have ever sent them south if it wasn't for Nimitz's message. Oh, so I, right. I would agree with that. I would agree with yeah, that yeah. because task force well, 34 had already been formed to sink the mm -hmm. cripples with the battleships. It wasn't until yeah. Nimitz sent that message that we all know about the world wonders where he's like, all right, fine. And he turns around and sends Lee's battleship south. Yep. So anyway, such is the Battle of Cape Engano. It is over after this. And and with it is a when it ends, it essentially closes the door on the Battle of Lady Gulf. Um, and you know, I put in the notes, in my opinion, the Battle of Lady Gulf was over before it began because the Japanese, we talked about this, you know, yeah, they they such a mismatch of of yeah. physical force available again if you bring more destroyers to the party than the other guy has carrier aircraft what's that say yeah. uh, but, so no I, I i'm basically in, in I, i'm in in the same boat with you it, it is over before it began even if Karita had managed to push through to the beaches we're still going to yeah. win yeah mm -hmm. but Did there's I, when i've heard that ozawa considered seppuku is that an accurate statement? I'm not sure. Um, that is based on older sources. And to be honest with you, I didn't have the opportunity to really dig into that to see if that's legit or not. So, yes, the, the rumor went around uh, that that Ozawa considered seppuku and um, was dissuaded by one of his officers who pointed out correctly that he was the only Japanese admiral that actually carried out his mission successfully during the entire battle that's true his mission was true. to have a ship sunk and they were sunk and they were sunk and and to pull halsey north which he effectively did absolutely mm -hmm. yeah he is the only one to complete his mission exactly as it was prescribed yeah you know we all know karita turns around we know nishimura is absolutely annihilated and Shima says, sees all that going on. He's like, nah, this ain't for me. <laughs> Later. Bye. But but yeah, I agree with you 100% with both of you 100% that if even if Karita goes down into the Gulf and starts shooting up what few transports are going to be there. And, and to be clear, they weren't all there by this time. But still, there were some there. And there is a beachhead there. And there are supplies on the, sh on the shore. And, and in order to, to get to that, they're probably going to end up chewing their way through Tappies 2 and 1 as well. Sure. To, you know, um, so, you know, I, I, again, I don't have a counterfactual crystal ball that's big enough to tell you how that goes down. Yeah. But if Karid is going to make it to Leyte, he's going to have to sink more American ships on his way to make that happen um which you know makes it look worse for uh, again probably gets into bill you're relieved you know that mm -hmm. we we can't have three taffies being savaged as a result of you forgetting to bring your battleships down and put them off of Surigao. yeah so in the span of five days of battle october 23rd through the 27th the imperial navy lost more ships than any other modern naval force in history. And we get into the numbers and it's kind of here and there. But according to Mark Still, over 310,000 tons of shipping was lost, which was naval shipping. Naval shipping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is 45% of the total tonnage involved. That That is ridiculous. But like you point out, though, John, I mean, Masashi was a 
Beast. Yeah, when I ran the napkin <laughs> math on that, Musashi accounts for roughly a quarter of that tonnage. Um, because, you know, depending on how you measure her displacement, she's between 68 and 72,000 tons. She's a, she's a very hefty girl. So, yeah, but the displacement tonnage uh, losses, as you pointed out here, were 26% of the entire losses suffered by the YJN in the entire war happened in this one battle, which is alarming. 69, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, I'm just, I'm just sort of looking in bafflement at that, just at that number again. I'd have to, I, I want to run those numbers myself actually, but no question of it. There's a hell of a lot of Japanese tonnage that goes down as a result of this battle. 69 ships are sent to the fight. 28 of them are lost, including four carriers here at Cape and Gagno. Bill, the personnel losses are staggering. Absolutely staggering. They are, yeah. More than 12,000 men were killed in the battle. The entire complement of six ships were lost. After Leyte Gulf, the Imperial Navy was finished as a fighting unit. With one suicidal exception, I guess, it would never sally forth again to do battle with the U.S. Navy. And we're going to talk about that one suicidal exception mm. in one of our 1945 episodes. Never again would the IJN send carriers into battle. The surviving flat tops would sail from time to time, but they would never sail into battle against the U.S. Navy ever again. Though so two would be lost, you said, John? Yeah, there's, there's two more pretty... <laughs> Pretty big ones. Uh, Amagi and Shinano are both going to be lost uh, in just the next couple months, hence, both with very heavy loss of life. Shinano, it's Archerfish. Archerfish takes Archerfish, the biggest, biggest, mm -hmm. biggest ship ever sunk by a submarine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the opposite side of that, the United States Navy, uh, compared to the Japanese losses, comes out light. Um, in terms of shipping losses and personnel, six American ships had been lost, and five of those were from Taffy 3. Of course, the one that wasn't was USS Princeton. Uh, personnel losses are another matter, however, though. Uh, 473 Americans lose their lives. 1,110 are missing, presumed dead. 1,220 are wounded, and the majority of these come from Taffy 3 who loses 311 killed in action, 877 missing in action, and 914 wounded in action. So, I mean, the figures aren't light, but compared to 12,000, it's a hell of a, a disparity yeah. between the two. Um, you know, performance on the American side of the battle, you know, we've gone over Halsey ad nauseum, and it's a mixed bag because Halsey kind of sours the bag of apples because the two Sprags, Thomas and Ziggy, perform great, you know, yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. Mark Mitcher yet again performs very well. Bill Oldendorf is, you know, Top flawless. Notch. Yeah, flawless Howard. in his execution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody but Halsey. Right. Yeah. So, anyway. Bill, you want to throw any more knives at, at, at William Halsey? No, I mean, <laughs> we, we burned Halsey for the three episodes at least. The You know, the, the, we said going into this that he hadn't had a sea command since 1942. The war had absolutely passed him by. I'm sure there was some, uh, I got to get mine, like Spruance got his at Phil C. There was some that that kind of motivation. That's the wrong motiva That's motivation yeah. to take into a battle. Winning is the right motivation to take into a battle. He's un inappropriately focused on the carriers rather than what could actually affect the outcome of the battle in Leyte Gulf landings. Spruance got that right on Saipan. Halsey gets it wrong. And and I actually, frankly, I would give him a, a bit of a pass if he hadn't been the one of those two dudes to be given a fifth star. And that was after the war was over. Right. And we had plenty of time to do soul searching on who did better. Right. And we decided... Halsey des deserved that fifth star, and Spruance didn't. And that's never sat right with me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, and I guess the, the last thing I'd point out, too, is that, you know, even after the war, Halsey also says, you know, I would have made it absolutely the same decisions all over again, which is just an asinine right. comment. <laughs> it's just, it is. There's, it is. 
ex post facto, you know, there's any number of ways to game this out better that, you know, comes out with a much more optimal solution for the Americans and even more carnage on the part of the Japanese um, with with markedly little risk to yourself. So, I yeah, I, there's mm-hmm. that, there's no way that that comment after the war that I would have done the same thing is in any way defensible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, a lot of his comments during the war were used against the United States, right? His, his racist comments were used verbatim against yeah. the United States, you know, to kind of inspire Japanese that things are going to go badly if right. the Americans win. And, and after the war, he spent the next 15 years defending his actions during yeah. the war, and then he sure. died, you know. Which, and so, uh, which is, a, he was which first, is what people do. But, I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, you think about Halsey and then on the other side of the other pond, you know, you've got every German general that managed to make it through the war is, you know, blaming Hitler for every boneheaded decision that was made on the Eastern Front and yada, yada, yada. I mean, finger pointing is is a game that uh, that everybody does. And top generals and, and admirals are certainly not immune from it. And, mm-hmm. and if if you ever see a general or an admiral admit that they were wrong, I'd like to know because most of them are infallible in their own eyes. And it's the truth, though. I mean, even even Admiral Nimitz, who we praised a gazillion times, said to his dying day that Peleliu was the right decision. And we all know that that was <laughs> certainly not the right decision. You know, and so in the case, I'll, same I'll thing as Halsey uh, here. You know? uh, there are some rare examples out there. Um, general Slim. Uh, who was the the guy who just absolutely got kicked to the curb in Burma during 1942 and then turns around and kicks the Japanese to the curb in 44 at Imphal. He was a profoundly humble guy. And if you read his narrative of those battles, he admits a litany of mistakes uh, during 42 that he then learns from. And turns it around. So yes, there are some cats out there who Very have, few. but they're few and far between. I think you're absolutely right. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Well, guys, anything else as we wrap up Battle of Lady Golf? Yeah. Thanks for the yeah. fun. Good. Yeah. It's always it's a good. pleasure. And I just got to say one more time: <laughs> nice shirt, guys. It's a beautiful yeah, shirt. Yeah. Isn't it? I like how you ought to wear it on your trip. Clash with the wallpaper at all? Not at all. Not at all. We're not in Hawaiian camouflage today. Ooh. Yeah. No, this is hate Ashbury camouflage. Yeah. Here is what this is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, the guy. So, the guy who did this shirt must have been on an LSD trip. I'm. I'm absolutely <laughs> certain about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> and John, enjoy your trip uh, to yeah, the well, Pacific. Yes. Yep. It's going to be a good time. It always is. So, yep. tell mm-hmm. tell my uh, former colleagues at the uh, old nine four five. I said hello. I'll do that. All right. Well, with that, we want to thank you very much for listening and or watching our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Wherever you receive your podcast, give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. Uh, if you got a question or a comment, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. So once again, my name is Seth Perdon. I want to thank you very much for listening and or watching. John, it is always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you very much for being here, and we will see you again soon. So we good. dip into 1945. There's a lot more stuff to talk about. Bill, bring us home. See you again next week.